Hi everybody, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and look at how out of focus I am. That's what happens when I try to live stream at 2 a.m. and I'm not quite ready to do this again. This is round two of NASA trying to launch the Parker Solar Probe to the sun. And this is actually a really, really exciting launch. Um, I can't wait for this one. Um, yesterday, they, they ended up scrubbing at about T minus one minute and 40 seconds. Uh, there was a VME hold from the launch provider, which is uh, United Launch Alliance, who is using their Delta IV Heavy to send this actually really small probe. This actually, this is, you know, before Falcon Heavy, uh, this actually still is a bigger, physically larger vehicle. Um, and, and as capable, if not, and in this configuration, it's more capable than what a Falcon Heavy would be. Um, so it's like the biggest rocket flying, carrying a tiny payload, but that's how much power it takes to get this thing to where it needs to go for the sun. Because it's actually really, really, really hard to lower the orbit uh, in a heliocentric orbit around the sun. So uh, let's talk about that here real quick. Um, so here, here, check this out. I, I keep reminding you guys uh, that this is this is the new thing, and I want you guys to all get used to this. Uh, check out my new pre-launch previews, and I'm gonna go down the rundown with you real quick. And look at this. Uh, if you hover over it now, it shows you T minus uh, 29 minutes and 19 seconds, and then you click on Delta IV Heavy, and this will tell you everything you need to know about this upcoming launch. So look, liftoff time. Um, so we're scheduled obviously at 3.31 Eastern Time Local because this is taking off in Florida. Um, this is again the Parker Solar Probe and this is uh, being launched by United Launch Alliance which is that joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Uh, but this is a NASA mission. So NASA paid, uh, you know, to use the Delta IV Heavy with United Launch Alliance, just like NASA pays SpaceX to launch cargo Dragon capsules. I noticed someone in chat said, like, is NASA going to land the stage? Oh, wait, NASA can't do that. Of course, NASA can actually do that every time they fly with SpaceX. Um, NASA is the customer for this. NASA is not the rocket designer. So, yeah, so to that, of course, NASA can land rockets when they're choosing a provider that is able to land rockets. Um, the Delta IV Heavy is expendable though, but that being said, it is extremely insanely powerful, has a ton of Delta V. Um, and again, remember, this is a big, big, big rocket launching a tiny little payload. Look at this, only 685 kilograms, 1,510 pounds. This is very, very small. Um, and again, it's going into the heliocentric orbit. It's heading into the corona of the sun. Um, and then we talk about a few more other things. So if you guys want a, a, the rundown, head over there. Um, but here's here's the thing about this mission. Um, why go to the sun, right? You might you might think that I'm going to also make sure that I have this kind of ready up here. NASA's live coverage in seven minutes. Oh, that's behind. Let's do this, and maybe we'll actually be on time. So I'll just have this here to make sure that we're not going to miss anything. Um, but the big thing is, you know, why are they sending this to the sun, right? Uh, the biggest thing, and this is the thing that makes me really excited, is we need to figure out why is the corona, so the atmosphere of the sun, why is that actually hotter than the surface of the sun? That goes against literally almost every single thing that we know, like any other laws of physics. And it's one of those just things that we haven't figured out about stars, is how can the atmosphere be hotter than the surface. It just really doesn't make sense. Oh, while this picture is up, let me let me pull this up. I do want to answer this one question that's going to come up all the time, and then we're going to uh, go back into talking about this this mission. There's going to be flames over here, <laughs> um, whoosh, right there. Uh, that's normal. That's the hydrogen. They have hydrogen tank. This the the, the Delta IV Heavy uses liquid hydrogen and and liquid oxygen instead of. Uh, most rockets you see tend to use RP-1, which is uh, liquid liquid kerosene or, or you know rocket propellant one and liquid oxygen. This uses liquid hydrogen. You can see it venting here, and instead of letting it just vent off into a giant cloud of hydrogen and potentially spark and go boomy, instead they purposefully just tap it off and, and as they as it's venting out, they do light it. Uh, so it doesn't cause any issues. And then, of course, like all rockets, you see it looking like it has all this smoke on here. That's not smoke. That is water vapor. That is condensation pouring off of the rocket. Um, the rocket is, um, ooh, good. Probability of violation is only 5%. This is good. This was this is as good as last night. Earlier today, it was, at like, it was only at like 60% uh, 
uh, go, so a 40% POV. Um, so this is good. I'm excited. Um, but yeah, so that smoke you're seeing isn't smoke. That is condensation pouring off the rocket because as um, liquid oxygen and liquid helium, as, as they vent out, they eventually you know warm up from the ambient air, uh, the, the warm ambient Florida sun. And even though liquid oxygen, I believe, uh, its freezing point uh, or melt melting point is like minus 107 degrees, I think, Celsius, um, oh, here, this is good, because someone else asked about the RS-68s. Uh, so this uses, again, so the RS-68 is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Um, they're made by Aerojet Rocketdyne. They're really efficient engines, and all three of these cores are the same thing, basically. And they all three burn these R um, RS-68 engines, which is really cool. And then they just peel away the side cores, then they burn that center core for a little bit longer. Um, and then they burn an upper stage, which is a cryogenic upper stage using an RL-10 engine, much like a Centaur upper stage of an Atlas V. Um, and again, that's a crazy efficient upper stage as well. Um, and then what's interesting about this mission, even with that little tiny probe, they have a third stage tucked inside there. And it's, it is a solid rocket booster made by Northrop Grumman. Uh, formerly, uh, Orbital ATK, I think, would have made that, that solid rocket booster. And that little booster is strong enough to give it 3,300 meters per second of additional delta V. So um, this is, so yeah, um, it's a star, yep, 48 BV. That's exactly right. Um, and someone asked in our Discord, does anyone know why they didn't use a, um, Evan asked why they didn't use a smaller fairing. I think Delta IV Heavy only has one size fairing, um, I believe. But that's a good question. I don't remember. Um, we'll get to a few more fun things. Uh, I need to real quick say hello to Corona Kivo. Nice name for today. How long will it take to get to the sun? So in six weeks, this probe will be doing a flyby past Venus. It'll get a gravity assist um, around Venus, and then that'll help lower its perihelion, its lowest point. Um, it'll get it closer to the sun. And then from there on out, it's only six more weeks. So basically in three months, this will it'll encounter its first time uh, touching the corona. And now what it has to do is it has to stay oriented perfectly um, because there's a giant heat shield. You know, people ask, why won't this thing melt? You know, if it's getting this close to the sun, why doesn't it melt? Well, it has a giant heat shield in the front of it that is made out of carbon carbon, which is that same um, front as the, the leading edge of the space shuttle. So the, the space shuttle wings whoop, um, up here. And the nose, um, both were carbon carbon. It's not the same as the, the silica tiles. There's a good shot of it there. Um, and it's not the same as the silica tiles that are um, right here. Those are, are different. And that's basically what's behind that leading edge. But then it's also actively cooled with water, um, which is, which is oh, there's only about a gallon of water on board, which is crazy. That's not very much. Um, and then what's interesting is, so it's past, it's actively cooled. And then it has these solar panels for when it's far away. It has kind of bigger solar panels because uh, it needs, when you are further away from the sun, you need big solar panels. Think of like how Juno, the, the probe that's out there around Jupiter, uh, is the only deep space probe to, to use solar powers uh, instead of nuclear power. Um, and it needs these huge solar panels um, because unfortunately you lose energy the further away you get from the sun. So if you go two times further away from the sun, you actually get four times less amount of uh, energy from it. So it's a square inverse law. So um, when the probe's far away, it uses these certain, uh, a certain type of solar panels that are not cooled. And then when it gets closer, it, start, it tucks those in and pops out these smaller ones. Um, and then what it's going to be doing is basically measuring like the, uh, the magnetism and radiation and a, f and a bunch of other things as it encounters the corona of the sun, which is really cool. Uh, hopefully to, you know, unsolve some mysteries so i'll keep going see here sorry aaron uh do i think arca will succeed with aerospike and if they do will they be bought out by spacex aaron i to be honest like i'm a big fan of everyone you know go at it i want them to try i do want to see an aerospike fly and I, and arca might make it happen they really might make it happen but um they have uh kind of had a, a interesting history so watching them pursue this is is interesting. Um, I don't really want to speak too much about them because I don't honestly know a ton. Uh, but I don't. 
I, there's nothing, to, in my opinion, there's nothing that Arca could do that SpaceX couldn't do. So if SpaceX wanted to pursue um, aerospikes, they would just do it. Um, but I always say there's a reason aerospikes don't fly um, and haven't flown yet. Otherwise, everyone would do them. Um, they're heavy, and they have yet to solve a few issues that are, that are you know, people made fun of me a lot, or, like, not made fun of me, but you didn't use aerospikes in that SSTO video that I made called Why SSTO Suck. And it's because aerospikes still, and they're like, you, aerospikes exist, you forgot about aerospikes. No, I, A, I talk about it, and B, uh, they don't fly. They have not flown on an operational rocket yet, so therefore I'm not going to talk about using that as, a, as an SSTO, and that's not something that is only usable by SSTOs. You can apply that same, uh, you know, exact same aer uh, aerospike engine to a multi-stage vehicle, and it'll still totally outperform the single-stage vehicle 10 to 1, you know, it's... So it's my, my, I stand behind the fact that a multi-stage vehicle is always more efficient, will always produce more work for less money, um, and less refurbishment costs, more importantly, um, than an SSTO. But yeah, aerospikes, we'll see. I would like to see them fly because I think they're awesome, but um, we have not seen one fly yet. I do, I, I'm a big fan of the linear aerospike, which is what the ARCA would use. And Thomas wants to know if this is a relaunch from yesterday. This is a, a re-attempt at that same launch as yesterday. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you. And Tradoth wants to know, woo, round two, no scrub today, please. Yes, let's keep our fingers crossed. Uh, I thank you. Matthew, proud Patreon supporter. Thanks, Tim, for all the amazing work. A launch isn't the same without your stream. Well, thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate your support. appreciate you saying hi. Uh, I'm glad I woke back up to be able to do this. I had very little sleep yesterday, so... Hopefully this thing goes off this time because I need to get some sleep because I'm flying out to California tomorrow. Uh, SpaceX is doing a, uh, a conference or a, um, a press conference on Monday and I will be there. Um, Arvid, good morning from Norway. Every day needs to start with a rocket launch. Absolutely. Uh, yes. I, or I guess every night needs to end with one for me, basically. Oh, and I, I missed, and thank you. And German for hi again. With a, with a heat shield of carbon carbon, wouldn't we send a manned flyby mission to the sun? Um, couldn't we send, sorry. Um, the, the radiation up there would be insane. Um, I don't think it'd be hospitable for humans. And why, really? That, I think that's the big... Um, I think that's the big question, was why would you do a human flyby of the sun? Like, there's nothing good that can come out of it, to be honest. There's nothing that humans could do in this case, data they could, that they could collect that, that a good probe can't do. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I guess that's my answer. Uh, Sammy, thanks for the live streams. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Renal Gaming, uh, evening. Hope it takes... Uh, hope take two is success. Any word on the reason for last night's scrub? So, um, I don't actually, I didn't actually see anything. And I was trying to kind of scrub up, scrub up. I was trying to kind of get a little bit more information about what exactly that, um, that cause was yesterday. But it obviously wasn't a huge deal because we're back here on the pad today. Um, and the scrub, they, they had two different things happening yesterday. They had that, um, the E, uh, I already forgot what it is because it's way too late for me. And um, and then we also had some kind of like helium tank uh, valve depressurization type of thing happen at T minus a minute and 40. So it's interesting. So we'll see. It looks, this is the same type of thing that happened when NASA used the Delta IV Heavy for um, for Orion, the EFT-1 EFT test flight. Uh, that was in December of 2014. Uh, it got out there and it sat there for four hours, fueled up, ready to go, and just didn't go the first day. Second day went off right at the beginning of the window. So sometimes you just gotta you gotta give her a, a quick second. So um, yeah, and tech uh, tech to GT five. You live in Titusville, watching from your roof by the river. Next time you come down, let's grab a beer. You can Scott Man, you and Scott Manley are my favorite space channels. Well, thank you so much. Oh, Takate GT five. I just now learned how to read. Uh, that sounds awesome. Um, I hope to make it down to Florida again soon. It's time that I catch a launch. It's been since March. That's a long time for me. Um, Alex Tut, thanks for staying up late twice. It's it's actually kind of difficult for me. I didn't realize that I'm this old, and it's hard for me to stay up this late. But uh, excited for launch, and you're going to freaking SpaceX tomorrow. So thanks and cheers. Well, thank you, Alex. Hello, and thank you for your tip. Um, it was a helium vent issue yesterday, says Alley Cat in our Discord channel. 
Yes, absolutely. And it was VME the first time. Yep. Uh, so they had two different. They did have two different holds, uh, two different hold issues, and one of them was at that, you know, that pre-planned hold. They they did not make it through the the go no go pull. So I'm going to actually turn up the volume here. Um, Watch teams as they prepare for lift off. But for now, we'll go back to Marie. All right, thank you, gentlemen. NASA's Tori McClendon is standing by live at one of our launch viewing areas with one of NASA's senior leaders, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin. Tori? Thanks. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to wait until we actually get to the countdown, and I'm going to keep answering your guys' questions here instead. Yeah, it's about T minus 15 minutes here, guys. Everything's looking good. Um, they, they do go into a... It seems like the sound is off. Is the sound off for anybody else? On Okay. Um... Uh, and let's see, sorry. And last night, uh, you know, they go into this four minute, right at T minus four minutes, they do go into a planned hold. It's actually like eight minutes into the into the countdown, but then they hold the clock at four minutes and they and they do a whole new poll and then they kind of hit play and say it's time to go. And um, one of the things I wanted to let you guys know, uh, I reminded everyone about this yesterday, I need to remember about this today. Um, the rocket... Don't panic. It is going to basically light itself on fire. So when it takes, right before it takes off, like right at like T minus one, you'll see it belch out this huge flame that will look like it's about to blow up. And it's really scary looking, but it's it's a signature of the Delta IV. Uh, the Delta IV again using hydrogen like that. They purposefully want to <laughs> let make sure there make sure there is no excess hydrogen. Um, in and around the combustion chambers or anything, so they actually flush it out first, ignite, and as it ignites, it, it, the anything excess ends up kind of going up in these flames, and it's normal, and it might look scary, but uh, I'll make sure and point it out right when it happens, and so the vehicle will leave the pad, like, charred already, and it's really cool. Um, yeah, I, I'm, a huge, I'm a huge fan of the Delta IV Heavy because this is the first rocket that I actually was able to really truly see with my own eyes um launch sorry and actually launch because uh, i saw ogo2 before that um which was out in vandenberg where i but i didn't really see it it was so foggy all i saw was like this and uh i had a beautiful launch in orion and when i saw the spacex launch due to all these different scrubs i ended up not really seeing the actual launch up close with my eyes so um although i saw the rocket did all the cool things there i didn't really get to see it launch uh in person so uh, I'm a big fan of the Delta IV Heavy. It's very close to my heart. And again, remember, in this configuration, um, it has a lot less thrust than the um, than the Falcon Heavy. It has, like, under half the thrust, actually, the Falcon Heavy. But that doesn't mean it has half the payload capability or half the payload uh, or half the Delta V. So it actually has a ton of Delta V. Um, it's a really efficient rocket. It is really, really efficient. So, um, and remember, it is expendable. And... It, SpaceX doesn't really have plans to fly an expendable Falcon Heavy, at least in the future. So when the SpaceX Falcon Heavy is reusable, fully reusable, um, it is less capable than an expendable Delta IV Heavy. And people might ask, you know, why didn't they, you know, why didn't NASA choose the Falcon Heavy? Isn't it cheaper? Um, don't forget, the Falcon Heavy still only flown once. This mission has been in the planning for eight years. At that time, the Falcon Heavy had never flown. Um, I don't know if it would still fly on a, on a mission like this that costs so much because it's still, you know, still pretty new. Um, and, you know, the Delta IV Heavy is a very reliable vehicle. Um, and so that has to be taken into consideration when you're flying a probe worth, you know, about a billion dollars or whatever. So, yeah. Um, and there's a cool shot of that heat shield. I, I think that's so cool. This is a really cool mission. I can't wait to see the data from it. Um, Footnote guy says, "Morning." Is the heat shield made of shuttle tiles? Sort of, but not actual shuttle tiles. The front part of the heat shield is the same thing um, as the nose of the space shuttle and the leading edges of the wings here. Um, those the same thing they got punched a hole in from the foam on Columbia. That's called carbon carbon. Um, that's what the heat shield's made out of. Um, but then behind that, there is silica tile. I think it's silica, or maybe just straight carbon. Um, packed together really tight but it's it's filled with a lot of air too um so i don't exactly know oh, i just love that thing um so again remember guys this thing's gonna be taking off here in about 12 minutes eee! uh and nozumi Yumi, play the they might be giants moving to the sun uh that's a good that's a good idea actually um 
Maybe they, uh, maybe NASA will. Maybe they'll surprise us. Uh, could these engines be used on SLE Evolved? Um, I don't know if they could be. Um, hang on, what what is SLE? Um, I don't I don't think unless you're thinking of Space Launch System Evolved. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I'm. I'm thinking you're thinking of like SLS evolved. Um, I don't know. Actually, how cool did those be for side boosters? The only problem is these hydrogen engines like this are really efficient, but they're typically very they're lower thrust than a counterpart in for the most part. Um, but they are more efficient. Um, and don't forget the RS twenty fives are um, are what are going to be on the SLS. The the core of it has four RS twenty fives. Um, the RS-68, oh, I think this is really cool, by the way, guys. Um, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, why do we care to study the sun? Um, but that is a huge thing, is if it's able to study and learn more about solar weather and the solar flares that come out of the sun. In, like, the early 1900s, a solar flare knocked out, uh, uh, what's that called? Sorry, it is so late for me. Well, uh, telegrams. Telegraphs got shut down for, like, four days due to solar flares. And can you imagine if our internet went out for four days? We would full-blown panic. The whole world would basically shut down. You know, our economy would be tanked. Um, bad things would happen if our internet fell completely apart for four days. Um, so the sooner we learn, you know, about solar flares and how to how all that stuff happens, um, hopefully we can learn how to like you know defend against it. So it's and especially with human spaceflight, that's going to be extremely important. I love that. Look at how cool that is. Um, yeah, so hopefully that... Yeah, SLS, all right? Aaron Khan. Um, I don't know... Yeah. I don't really know if they could be used for that, but they're cool engines. They're pretty expensive, um, but and I don't think they're as pow... They're about as powerful, I think, as the RS-25, actually, now that I think about it. Um, I think very similar, not, not, but yeah. Um, Helmet, what's the SpaceX press conference about? The SpaceX... Um, there's a, uh, a thing going on. Actually, I don't know if I can talk about it yet. Or maybe I shouldn't have said anything. You'll see on Monday. Uh, Lewis, I love your channel, and you're a Patreon. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that, Lewis. And hello. And hi, Matt Carlos. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, oh, there we go. Klaus, uh, Klaus Kopf says they are derivatives of the RS-25. I did not realize that. I knew the thrust levels were similar. They don't seem to vector nearly as much as a as an RS-25 does, um, or gimbal. They're very... Oh, here's a... And this is a shot of that upper stage. So you'll see it detached from the payload adapter. And then it's going to use a kick stage, uh, which is a solid rocket booster upper stage. And it's going to give it, again, like 3,300 meters per second of delta V. Um, and by the way, this is going to end up being one of the fastest spacecrafts ever. Uh, it'll end up going like 700,000 kilometers an hour which is uh, 430,000 miles an hour. And it's going to get all the way down to 6.4 million kilometers from the sun, uh, which is about 4 million miles. So it's going to go really fast. It's going to get really close. Um, yeah. It's, it's going to be pretty fantastic. Um, I wonder what a speck of dust will do at 0.05 light speed. That's a great question. Uh, and hey, Cody's Lab, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, Andromeda, you love your, I love your videos. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you. Uh, I like making videos a lot. Um, yeah, it's something that I just genuinely enjoy doing. Uh, guys, what are you guys thinking? I think this is going to happen tonight. I'm feeling good about this one for some reason. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I, I can't wait to hear the go, no go poll, which should be coming up any minute. Um, so we'll listen in here actually. I'll make sure and turn this up. Uh, and no zoom you. To proceed with terminal count. Wants to know First if it's going to be the SpaceX Propulsion. suit. Go. No, Hydraulic. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Third stage systems. Third stage vehicle manager. Go. Electrical systems. Airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GCQ. Go. 
Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Yes, let's Proceeding do this. Proceeding with account. MEQ yes. established swing arm lock pins pulled. Active. And we just hold, heard the poll with all stations reporting that yes. they're go for launch. Alyssa, we're, we're entering the final few minutes of the count here, about five minutes and 45 seconds before we launch. And can you tell me what it means to United Launch Alliance to be able to launch the Parker Solar Probe mission? Yeah. Um, Sweet. ULA right. is always... Um, let's keep answering some questions here. Uh, Matt, what happens if solar flares hit the probe? They probably will. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good question, though. Um, it is designed to be very radiation radiation tolerant and especially very heat tolerant. So hopefully it can survive that kind of stuff. It's actually considered one of the most redundant and one of the most um, uh, fully autonomous probes because we don't have any room to fly it. Because if it starts to go off center and say that it drifts away where this heat shield is not pointing at the sun, that thing will melt in a matter of minutes. So it does need to stay oriented perfectly. So there's a lot of systems. Oh. Make sure they go into this. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. Okay, that's good. Let's get into that, out of that planned hold. Uh, Stefano wants to know if I'm getting a new suit. And we have about Not 30 yet. seconds remaining in our hold in the team minus clock. After that, the L minus and the T minus clocks will be synced up. You're looking at a live shot of the Delta IV heavy rocket poised for liftoff from Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. All right. Um, I, I'm not getting a new suit, especially not from, from SpaceX, but uh, I, will I will be getting a new count. one soon. Five, four, Here we go. three, two, one. To get to the T minus four. T minus four minutes and counting. Okay. Four Ice minutes, everybody. Five. Um, and Sven Ground wants to enabled. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Sven wants to know <laughs> place this bit on no explosion. Absolutely. Uh, but again, remember, we will see this rocket essentially light itself on fire at first, so don't be scared. Uh, the Heaven Man 88. What do I think about SpaceX getting into nuclear rockets? The rocket designer hinted at that before. Um, nuclear is a phenomenal propulsion. Um, they would definitely need government, like, approval slash cooperation for that and i would love to see that happen so we'll see um kimberly oculus go yes <laughs> um and math and thank you um matthew why are they launching retrograde because that's how you you have to you launch they're still launching in uh you know eastbound from florida they aren't launching westbound from florida so they're still launching prograde you know in relation to the earth but to leave earth's orbit they are going to be going retrograde um compared to the orbit of the going around the sun and that will lower um the periapsis so that's going to bring the, sp the sun or the probe closer to the sun and that's why it's going to be flying essentially backwards in orbit around the sun hence retrograde so that's um it needs to slow itself down in order to s fall closer to the sun basically um hopefully that helps Use o o o zone, uh, generate ozone generator to make the suit not stink. Sounds like a pro move. Okay, I'm going to listen in here. We're checking to make sure spacecraft is on internal power. That's important. So it's not getting power just from the umbilical anymore. Cheers from Zachary. Thank you. And we are at T minus two minutes, five seconds and counting. After liftoff, we'll be listening to the voice of United Launch Alliance, Patrick Moore, providing ascent commentary. 155. Hey, Alex. Launch sequence or start. All right, this is about where we got to yesterday, so we're deeper in the count. Let's do this. Minus 140. FCS launch enable. 137. We're in there. We're getting there, guys. The LH-2 at flight pressure and flight level. FTS armed. 
Minus 120. <sighs> My heart's beating. We'll see you FCS count started. Alright, so a reminder, this is in Florida. This is at Space Launch Complex 37B, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. One minute. Sweet, Engine here we go. Box, go. Rock, report range status. Range green. Hey, thank you, Rodney. 50. Alright, we're still looking good, guys. LCOVM. Third go stage is go for launch. Roger. Range green. Second stage, LH2 secure at flight level. 40. Alright guys, I can't wait. Minus 30. Status check. Go Delta. Go PSP. Yes. Oh, I love these flagship NASA missions like this. Not flagship, sorry, but NASA missions like this. These are so exciting. Minus 15. Profi ignition. Alright, get ready. It's going to light itself on fire. Going to see Ten, flames. 9. Nine start. 8. 8. 7. 6. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV yes, heavy rocket yes, yes. with NASA's Parker Solar Probe, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. Wow. Look at that. What a beast. Three RS-68s look good in the full thrust mode. They are all RS-68s look good in the full thrust mode, is that? Oh, that's a cool shot. 25 seconds into flight. Chamber pressures continue to look good on all three boosters. Now 35 seconds in. Chamber pressure on the core booster is uh, throttling down to the partial thrust mode. There you can see the center Response booster is good. down. Because it needs to maintain a little bit of extra fuel so we can do a longer burn on the side. Now 50 seconds into flight. Strap-on boosters look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the uh, partial thrust mode. Yes. Now one minute into flight. I'm really missing the telemetry. Vehicle trajectory looking good right down the middle of the range track. One minute, ten seconds into flight. Look at that flame. Coming up on one minute, nineteen seconds into flight. Max Q, maximum dynamic. Pressure and Mach 1 Delta IV is now supersonic. You can see it now is in the part of the atmosphere. It's going to create that contrail. That's why all of a sudden you see the One minute, 30 seconds into flight. Port and starboard booster engines continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. One go minute, Delta. 45 seconds into flight. Go Delta, go NASA. Trajectory continuing to look good right down the middle of the range track. <laughs> it's gone to plaid. <laughs> ACS press valve has been opened. ACS pressure and also response thank you, looks good. Marcus. Two All minutes, right. ten seconds in. Strap on boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. They normally do have cameras on the Delta IV. And Delta IV has so. gone to closed loop guidance. But it looks like a really clean or clear night, so we might get. Two more minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Ground tracking like this. I think the, the side core boosters will detach here fairly soon. And at two minutes, 39 seconds into flight, the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. Just three dots. I would love to an on on And launch vehicle camera. is now 33 miles in altitude, 49 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,500 miles per hour. Wow. Three minutes into flight. Our 68A engines in the port and starboard boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. All right, here it comes. Three minutes, 15 seconds into flight. Side booster deploy will be pretty soon here. Trajectory continuing to look good down the middle of the range track. Yeah. 
5,000 pounds per second of fuel. That's approximately two minutes remaining in the boost phase of flight. That's crazy. Chamber pressure is continuing to look good on all three boosters. Port and starboard booster in the full thrust mode, core booster continuing in the partial thrust mode. And standing by for a strap-on booster throttle down momentarily. Oh, port and starboard boosters have begun to throttle down. There we go. Stage separation. And we have jettison of both strap-on boosters. That's good. That's good. Get out of there. Core booster is throttled back up to full thrust. Response looks good. Uh, Renau says they missed the SpaceX trajectory overlay. I do too. It gives you more to talk about, so bear with me here. Four minutes, 25 seconds into flight. All right. Upper stage lock system has begun boost phase chill down sequence. Okay. So they're going to be getting ready and to... One minute remaining in boost phase of flight. So there's another a full minute for this the center core to keep burning, and they're getting to ready to chill the upper stage so they can ignite that And upper stage 10. fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. So now they're getting ready to light up that. You know, they're going to do stage separation of the center core in the second stage, and then as it pulls away, they they light up that second stage engine, which is an RL10 engine. Oh, look at those! I think those are the side boosters. Five minutes into flight, just over 30 seconds now remaining in first stage first stage phase of flight. Core booster engine continues to look good in the full thrust mode. Vehicle trajectory continuing down the middle of the range track. Looking good. Five minutes, 20 seconds into flight. Uh, Leopold Kranz says, are we going to be able to see the and rocket itself? Standing by for core booster throttle down momentarily. You may have missed it if you weren't here about five core minutes ago. Core booster has begun to throttle down. Okay, Standing I'm by for Pico. I'm surprised there aren't cameras, onboard cameras. And we have Pico booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage step. Okay, good. Center core is... And we have good indication of stage separation. All right, Ned so is deploying. there we go, stage SEP. We have pre-start on the RL-10. And we have ignition on the RL-10 engine. That's very good, very important. Engine chamber pressure looks good. Now, ULA opts to make, to do these uh, overlay graphics. Now we finally do get to see <laughs> our velocity. And we have and good everything. indication of payload fairing jettison. Sweet. Okay, so... There we get a good sense of its altitude. It's it's not now, very high. Now six minutes high. twenty seconds into flight. It's it's less than you know a hundred. And with the boost phase of flight complete, Parker Solar Probe will now continue its journey to the sun. But it is outside of the Kármán line, so it is in the in the vacuum of space. Um, there we go. So it's already six hundred forty. So that's a thousand kilometers downrange already, um, and it's coming up. That is cruising. Um, 1600, so, uh... And it's 6 minutes, 50 seconds into flight. So we're about 23,000 kilometers RL-10 chamber pressure looks good. Ah, oh, Seeing Matthew. good responses on the upper stage RCS system. So jealous, Matthew says he lives in Florida. And Got uh, an awesome after view. after a brief review of booster performance, seeing very close to nominal performance on the booster very close to nominal performance. Hmm. I hope that's okay. <laughs> they didn't say it was nominal. And this first burn of the second stage will last approximately 4 minutes 42 seconds. Now 7 minutes 30 seconds into flight. About 3 minutes remaining in the first burn. So people might ask, you know, why isn't it an animation now? Well, it's, as you can see, downrange is already 1,000 miles, so 1,600 kilometers downrange. Uh, we don't have cameras that can see that far because it's already flown over the horizon. Um, but the cool thing is, actually, if you are in the flight path of this in very soon, you'll be able to see it, actually. Um, there's tons of videos of, you know, when SpaceX or other companies are doing ISS rendezvous, they often fly over England um, about seven minutes after takeoff. You can actually see it go right over your head. Um, it's crazy. Eight minutes, 30 seconds into flight, 
RL10 chamber pressure continues to look good. That's good. Seeing very stable values on the upper stage LOX and LH2 tanks. Um, and, and that's just like, um, you know... ACS storage bottle pressure looks good. Sorry, I'm also trying and to And vehicle sure. body rates are very smooth. Um, it's just also like uh, the Ariane 5 that launches uh, down in South America. They also put up animations right away because if you don't have a camera shot, yeah, what are we going to be looking at? So, so this just shows us our telemetry. It gives us something to look at um, and lets us know, according to the data, where the vehicle is. Um, so there we go. It, it is a little less exciting, but yeah. Um, yeah, here we go. We're coming up. It's almost going to be into into its orbit, its parking orbit, pretty soon here. And then it'll coast for a while. And then it'll light that kick stage. Well, oh, I think actually minutes, 40 seconds into flight. Just under one minute remaining now in the first burn of the second stage. Second stage continuing to perform nominally. RL-10 engine performing well. Uh, tank pressures look good. Vehicle body rates remain smooth. Mako, thank you for the tip. And uh, Takate says, amazing from your house. Just got back inside. Mosquitoes are trying to carry you off. That's cool. It shook more than a Falcon 9. I and about don't doubt it. 30 seconds remaining in the first burn. All right, almost coming up to Miko 1. And, and Mako, they use Imperial. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a shame, honestly. Really wish it was metric. Um, and Johan, thank you very much, and hi. All right, so let's see here. Let's see if we learn anything here. At, at Miko, it's going to go into a parking lot. I'm standing by for Miko for one momentarily. And we have Miko. It's good. Body rate's smoothing out nicely. Sweet. So now it's in a parking orbit. And now seeing uh, upper stage ACS firings as expected. Now 11 minutes into flight. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up. Um, this will show us how much time we're going to be. So, by the way, real soon here uh, at 9, there's a chance if you live down here in, in Africa... Uh, you'll get a chance to see second stage uh, ignite here, which would be really, really cool. Um, so that's how long it's coasting. It's, it's coasting from here, from 8, which is Seco, um, or I guess Miko 1 for them. Uh, and then, boom, they will reignite there. Um, why, as an American, why can't the U.S. go metric? As an American, I want to know the exact same question. If I knew the answer, I would let you know. Um, so... So yeah, so let's let's go through a few things here. I'm going to listen in to what they're saying here. Second engine start, um, and then in just forty, approximately forty-five minutes, uh, we'll see payload separation. So everything's looking good so far. Great. And can you tell me a little bit about 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 your experience working with ULA and and what it's like to work in a mission like this again? Yeah. Um, so I get to I get to work with the. So um, okay. So while we're here, let's talk again about this. Um, so here, this is a, a cool cutaway here of, of basically what this vehicle was. So it's three of the same boosters for the, 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 the common core boosters um, on the side and the center core using those R, R, RS-68A engines. And then you see there's that RL-10 on the upper stage. And then again, we're going to see it. It's going to have to ignite that third stage, that upper, upper kick stage. Dang, Andromeda, the ultimate. Thank you so much for your generous tip. You didn't have to do that at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we should all be giving you some appreciation to ULA and, and, and NASA for a really successful mission so far. Uh, but thank you, Andromeda. That really means a lot. Uh, I'll be taking that to California with me, making sure I get what I need to get done out there. So thank you. Um, so I guess while we're out here, too, while we're kind of waiting for coast phase... I'll just be listening and making sure we're not going to miss anything here. Um, but I did want to mention, too, I really want you guys, I, I need you guys. There's 5,600 of you there right now. Please, please enter this Project Mars competition. I'm a judge. 
along with the guy that directed Star Wars, Bobak, a phenomenal uh, rocket scientist out at at, uh, at Jet Lab at a JPL, a Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Sorry, I read Jet Lab. Uh, at JPL in California. Nicole Stott, an actual astronaut. Some really, really cool people. Another astronaut, Samantha. Um, and if you guys want a chance to win, this is this is with NASA and this um, Project Mars. All you have to do is you make a little short film. Use your smartphone. Make me cry. Tell me about how you want to go to NASA. Make a fictional story about your friends building a rocket out of cardboard or something. I don't care. Create some really cool artwork on a poster and you can win a good amount of money. $10,000 for the best film. I will see it. So will all these people. They'll watch your film. It's due August 31st and we need more entries. So if you guys want a chance to win uh, a good, healthy thing make a cool film make a cool poster uh send it into project mars competition there's a link in the description below um i'm a big fan of this i am a big fan of the arts that's how i got started was as a professional photographer and you know it's i think this is important i think it's important to be inspired um stem uh, this the science technology engineering mathematics is so important to add the art element to that so do it make me cry let's see what you got out there the internet um I, yeah, I can't wait. Uh, another reminder, too, uh, if you guys want to know upcoming launches, uh, go to my website and click on pre-launch previews where you'll get all the things, including how long before they take off, nine days. And you can just click on here and go, oh, look, here's everything I need to know about this. Um, and then while we're at it, click on over to shop. Boop. And look, check out all my new T-shirts, guys. We have, like, we have some of my favorite ones, like this F1 Aerojet Rock, or wait, Aerojet Rocket Dad F1 engine can be on your chest. So can my helmet. So can rocket science or bikinis, apparently. I don't sell bikinis. I don't know why that's there. Um, so, yeah, if you guys want to check out some brand new shirts, like the one I'm wearing, too, this has a logo on the back. A logo on the back. Put it on your back. Unless it's on your front, too. Um, yeah, but this one I'm really excited about the, the rocket science shirt. This one's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you were, Arvid says they were disqualified from entering Project Mars competition. I'm really sorry about that, Arvid. I would like to know why. Um, I'm sorry. That's too bad. Three-sided coin that is between watching, um, oh, Chris, uh, uh, is, a, is a slum, slum. uh, why does it look like the engine is still firing? They do use that RCS to orient it to prepare it for that next burn. Um, so that's just kind of normal. Um, yeah, so the main engine is no longer firing. The three-sided coin, the difference between watching a ULA and a SpaceX launch is the same as between watching <laughs> your deadpan math teacher and your whimsical art teacher. Um, says the three-sided coin, I really do wish that ULA would invest a little more in making um, more engaging launch coverage because it, it is it's important we that's the all we have to go off of you know that's how we watch this stuff and if if your live streams don't show us all the data and give us really cool camera angles we don't get a good sense of your company and your amazing rockets so please yole take just step it up one notch just a little notch and we'll be happy um yeah that'd be great um Footnut guy, can you do a calendar that works on your phone calendar? There's some good apps like SpaceX Now, Rocket Launch that are um, that are calendars. Oh, are you saying one that would just automatically sync to your phone's calendar? Ooh, I would like that. I would like that. Um, that would be really cool. Do I think the F-1B engine, the more powerful version of the F-1 engine, will ever fly? I don't think it will. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're beyond that now. I think we're kind of getting into the days of... Um, smarter engines and more efficient engines than the F-1B, which would be really cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> Have I checked their official shop if it's shipping? Sorry, I don't... Oh. Um, I could use a public Google Calendar. Maybe what I'll have to do is I'll have to sync it up to Launch Alarm, or launch uh, the Launch Library, because that is actually how I'm pulling all that data now. Not me. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine is doing all that. It's, it's just a amazing so um yeah that'd be amazing sloppy i think we'll work on it in our discord channel um and while we're in this coast phase i do want to mention if you want to join our exclusive discord channel uh or our exclusive subreddit 
Or if you want a chance to win flown space shuttle material like this, I have these two guys. These are going to be sent out to Patreon supporters here. Um, yeah, this is this is how you guys can support what I do. Um, it's not really just this. This is this is sort of for fun for me because I watch these launches anyway. I might as well be telling you guys what's exciting about them. Uh, but what really takes up my time is researching videos um, and producing all the videos and doing all that stuff. Now running the website full time too. Um, if you guys want to help me uh, continue to do what I do uh, and a chance to win space shuttle material like this and like this, um, head on over. I'll frame this up. I'll ship it out to you. Um, and if you want a chance to win, head on over to everyday or patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Thank you because that is literally the reason I'm able to do this. I would not be able to do what I do without you guys. Um, this is beyond a full-time job for me, 60, 70 hours a week. And it's all thank you to my Patreon supporters. Truly, I, I really, I would have totally been going back to my old job as a photographer if it wasn't because of your Patreon supporters. So thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, then uh, Matt says Elon is spoiling us with those onboard cameras. They're, and what's funny is I know there's onboard cameras with, with Delta IV heavies. I've seen them a few times. Um, I wish that ULA would, would start doing more onboard cameras because they're really cool, you, especially when you do a night launch and all of a sudden you see the, the Earth go into daytime as you're getting into the um, daytime portion. I just think that stuff's so cool. So I really wish they would do that. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, Arvid, un unfortunately, the contest is limited to college students and early career professionals less than five years in the industry. I did not realize that, Arvid. Um, well, yeah, shoot. Um, well, there you go. If you're a college student... Or uh, an early career professional less than five years in the industry, um, then please enter the contest. But please enter the contest. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I will buy Space Sun and Rocket Swimwear. <laughs> I love it. Um, let's see. Sorry, just trying to catch up here. Um, and Max, the Space Launch Now app can sync with your calendar. Also, keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Max. Um, yeah, the Space Launch Now is a, is a great uh, app. There's also SpaceX Now. There's also Launch Alarm. Um, there's lots of really good resources if you guys want to stay on top of how to know when upcoming launches are. Um, and like I said, if you don't want an app on your phone, head on over to my web website, um, you know, everydayastronaut.com. Check out that pre-launch preview. And especially, I will be doing any of those articles. So if it has a link, that is for sure one that I will be covering. Um, so that's one way to know, like people ask me, are you covering this? Are you covering that? If you just go to the pre-launch previews and, and look at which ones are highlighted, um, those are ones that I will for sure be covering. Um, yeah. Uh, David, can't you give us a hint about the SpaceX conference? Um, I, I honestly just don't know if it's public yet, what's happening on Monday. Um, so I can't, unfortunately, no. Um, Hamish, does the second or third stage engines vector? Um, I. You know, I don't actually... The RL-10 is capable of vectoring, but, but they always have RCS that seems to point it um, on the upper stage. And I, I believe the SRB does not have a vector, and I believe it also has um, RCS that points it. But I'm not positive, so don't entirely quote me on that. Um, oh, here we go. I'm going to return it here. Oops. Thank you, Marie. I'm here again with Alyssa McBeth, and we've been monitoring uh, the flight uh, as it's gone so far. And can you tell us a little about uh, where we are now and what's about to come up next? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there was two, bur two burns of the second stage. So we're about to come up on that, that second burn. Um, after that, the engines will um, light and uh, will enter that, that phase. Uh, and then they'll cut off and will enter into a coast phase right before second stage separation. Um, then uh, the third stage will ignite um, at approximately um, 37 minutes into the flight, um, and that will be our last and final burn before spacecraft separation. So we had a great launch on time this morning at 3.31 a.m., but, there, but there's still more work to do there is. Uh, before the spacecraft separates. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me what's, what's next for, for United Launch Alliance? Yeah, our team is still working. To, they're monitoring data uh, in the launch control room and in Denver as well as here, um, just looking to make sure everything looks nominal, um, that the booster performed. They're probably looking at data from the booster and making sure everything looked, looked clear and good there. Um, and a, as we continue through the flight, they'll continue to do that. 
Well, once again, you're looking at uh, live telemetry feed here. That's it's an animated feed that you see of the second stage. Uh, when the very top of it, you see NASA's Parker Solar Probe yeah, there, yeah. Uh, which is moving toward its separation time. And we just have confirmation of ignition of the RL10 engine. Good. Second stage is reignit. Re and with that, Alyssa, thank you for joining us today, and uh, thank Pretty you for good. a great launch. Thanks for having me again. Yes. Thanks. Sweet. That's good. Um, ben Woodington wants to know, who's going to get people to the ISS first, Boeing or SpaceX? To be perfectly honest, I have zero idea at this point. I thought, hopefully, I thought we were going to be launching people to the ISS in 2017. It's taking longer than I would have hoped, but it's okay, as long as it gets done right. That's what matters. Safety first. And, and getting people up there safely is what matters. Um, and honestly, it's still anyone's game at this point. They just keep kind of going back and forth and back and forth. I just hope so bad that it happens in 2019. If we don't get humans up to the ISS in 2019 with the commercial crew providers, I will be very, very disappointed. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Dorkmata Gaming, how, did, how is the probe going to survive the hellish conditions near the sun? So, see this gray heat shield in the front? Um... That's uh, made out of carbon carbon. It's a carbon carbon leading edge, and behind it, then there's silica tiles uh, or carbon carbon tiles behind it as well. Active at, uh, liquid cooling. There's about a gallon of water on board, and it radiates heat away. Um, and it will get up to like uh, 1,370 degrees Celsius, which is 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is crazy hot. But it you know it has the systems that mitigate that heat and and make sure it doesn't the heat doesn't actually get to the spacecraft. That's what that heat shield is for. That's basically how it will survive. And it will only do passes for like a couple hours, you know, really is, is how long it's close to the sun. And then it goes back out around uh, for a couple months. So it's not like it's just parked at the sun and going to cook forever. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah, they're, I'm going to just... Uh, and then, oh, and Conrad, thank you very much for your tip. Um, so yeah, so that that's how carbon nanotube says uh, Simon Razor. Um, so um, yeah, there's well, Biggie Smalls. This is an animation. What you were looking at was an animation. Uh, that's because the vehicle is currently over Africa and it's daytime. You can't see it. It's a, a hundred and seventy miles or like two hundred and fifty kilometers in altitude. It's really high up. Um, if you, I, I don't really want to respond to, to conspiracy theories about rockets. You can go watch them yourself. Literally, I've seen a dozen. Just go to Florida. Go to California. Go to wherever the closest rocket launches to you. And, and I love when, I'm not going to get into it because it just, it's just not even worth the time. Um, because there's a lot more exciting stuff. This is how you advance humanity, is by learning more. We, who knows, who, guys, this could be the thing that actually unlocks uh, cold fusion for us or something, because we are going to learn so much more about the corona, about the sun, about stars, how they actually work uh, by getting close to the corona and learning why it's so freaking hot in the corona as opposed to the surface of the sun. It, we don't have a good understanding of that yet. And this is going to be the stuff that, who knows, in 20, 30 years, this might be the mission that just totally unlocks a whole new understanding um, of physics, which would just be amazing. So, um, Sys Power Tools, my name is on that, is yours. Yes, I did sign up for that a while ago. Um, they did a thing where you could put your name in, and they would put it on the probe and basically send your name to the sun, which I think is really cool. Uh, German Fur, just wanted to tell you that you made me love space again. Meeting you in person is on your bucket list. Well, dang, well, thank you, German Fur. I'm glad that I could help. That's, for me, what it's all about is is not, people need to understand that you can be a everyday person, everyday astronaut, everyday person. You don't have to be a scientist to really get excited about this stuff and nerd out about this stuff. Um, it's exciting stuff that we all can benefit from. And we can all be big supporters and cheerleaders of what the scientists, the people that study and do their entire careers combing through this data, dreaming up these amazing missions, we can be here to support them publicly and, and express our excitement and get excited ourselves. And I think that's exactly what it's all about. 
Um, I don't have a huge understanding of all this stuff, but I know enough of, en enough to help you guys hopefully get excited. That's my goal. I'm not an expert, but I do hope to have a general enough understanding of all this stuff to help you guys get excited and help you understand why this stuff matters, um, what's happening, you know, who, what, where, why, and when. Um, if I can kind of do that, then I'm doing my job, and I, I really appreciate you saying that. So hopefully I'll be able to do a meetup wherever you are if, if you're a human with a face maybe i'll see you sometime um anytime you launch and get into orbit it's data says sloppy it's true um whoa v monkey <laughs> jeez holy cow well you're welcome um dang thank you so much for your generous tip that is very, very, very kind of you. Um, I don't know what to say. That really means a lot, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm like I said, I'm just excited. I'm just here to help you guys get excited. So I really appreciate. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you <laughs> get being excited too. So thank you very, very, very much. Very sincerely, thank you. Uh, Camilo, jeez, guys. <laughs> Camilo, you're in Hollywood, Florida. Watch it launch from your front yard. No shirt, just pants, and I saw it. Looked up, looked like a plane, but I know it was. That's awesome, Camilo. I'm very jealous. Uh, thank you for your tip. Thank you. And Bradley Cross is the third stage considered a kick stage. It's actually considered an upper stage in this. Um, you know, it is a full-blown, dedicated stage. Um, I kind of just jokingly called it a kick stage because it's kicking 3,300 meters per second of Delta V into this probe. Um, and it's tucked away inside the payload fairing, which I don't actually know the definition between a kick stage, you know, why exactly one would be considered um, a kick stage and one wouldn't. I don't actually know. Um, but yeah, I, I think you could loosely say that term. Um, but it's definitely, it is a full blown third stage, really. Um, and thank you again. And Carl from Vista, they are probably firing small thrusters to keep the fuel at the back of the tank during the coast phases. That is true. They only need to do eulage like that before they fire up the engine. So they don't have to do it the whole time. But you definitely will notice, you know, 20 to 30 seconds before engine ignition that they will use RCS like that to push. Think of it like this. When you go into zero gravity, all of a sudden all the fuel is just floating there, right? And it's inside that tank. And... If you try to turn on the pumps, they might start sucking up a lot of the air and not sucking up fuel, which is really bad when you're about to light your engine. So what they do is they, they use the RCS to basically think of it as like a net about to catch, and it just ends up catching all that fuel. Um, you know, all the fuel is free-floating here, and they can just go and then catch all of it. That way it's pushed to the back of the vehicle. Then they can light up the engines. And then once the engine's lighting, it's basically producing g-forces which keep that engine the fuel still pushed down to the bottom of the tank um so yeah they do need to do that eulage maneuver um before reigniting a stage in space and even before igniting it the first time after stage separation they'll have to fire something like that and you'll see that with basically every vehicle um so thank you three-sided coin follow-up videos for this and tests and others um three-sided coin you know i'm trying to I'm kind of rejiggering my approach to what videos I do these days. Um, I, I think I'm trying to be less... I, I don't want to chase the, the news grind, if that makes sense. Like I'm trying to not um, always be chasing, oh, this mission is going to come out, so I need to have a video right now with this mission. Now, this mission, like I don't want to be news, you know what I mean? I want to give you guys those deep rundowns on things that might be forgotten about or might be just something that you never figured out the answer to instead of there's so many people um including nasa and the companies doing the stuff that that will do more of that you know on the beat kind of news as stuff is happening um but when there's something i'm trying to kind of figure out what exactly my niche will be um and i love like doing the the countdowns like the the biggest booms and things like that that's a lot of fun i love doing the the things that i've been doing lately with like when i went down and visited boeing and put on their spacesuit that was definitely a lot of fun um i have a list still like this long of videos um, and if I run out of ideas I will definitely be getting into more of those but uh, for now I, I will see and maybe when something really exciting comes up then yes absolutely it will be worth touching up on catching up on Tess and um, and this mission as well so but thank you three-sided coin Cameron just watch the Florida viewing locations video are you going to make a vehicle a Vandenberg Air Force sorry a Vandenberg Air Force base 
uh, viewing locations video soon too. Thanks for all the hard work. You're welcome, Cameron. Um, I do need to do that. That's a pretty good resource, especially as uh, Vandenberg ends up being a pretty popular launch destination these days too. Um, yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, I'll put that on my list. That one's a little harder. I haven't. I I don't know as much. I've only been out to one Vandenberg launch. So I don't have as much personal. You know what I mean? I've been out to the Cape a lot. I have a pretty good sense of that. So I'll have to maybe do a little more research for Vandenberg. Um, but that's a great idea. Um, and Fessland, how long until the probe reaches the sun? The first time will be six months. And then it'll, it's in a, in a highly elliptical orbit. So it'll do its first flyby in six months. And then it does its first flyby of Venus in about three months. Or wait, no, it'll do its first flyby of the sun, sorry, in three months. It'll do its first flyby of Venus in six weeks. And then six weeks after that is when it reaches the sun. Um, and then it will kind of do these big elliptical orbits. It'll end up out around the, the down around the sun, and occasionally it'll end up doing seven gravity assists by Venus to lower its orbit and speed it up too. So it's pretty pretty cool, pretty cool mission. The people that think of that stuff, they're crazy. Um, can everyone go to the IAC, the International Aeronautical Congress? Uh, asks Oliver. Um, that's a good question, actually. Uh, I think anyone in the industry can go. You might have to have some kind of a student um, or some kind of something that kind of lets you know that you can. Um, but that's a good question. Um, Second stage this. fuel and oxide of tank pressures remain stable. ACS press bottle uh, also looks good. This is a long burn. Um, Twisted Whispers wants to know thoughts now on Virginia. passing 35 minutes into flight. Uh, Virginia launch sites. Um, Virginia launch sites are cool. There's Wallops Island out there where where Orbital ATK, now north of Grumman, uh, launches their Cygnus um, and on, on top of their Antares rocket. Um, it's, it's a really cool launch site, and it's really close. A lot of big cities can actually see the launches from there, which is really cool. Um, but I and maybe you're you're referring to me need, needing to do a video on where to watch viewing locations from from wallops. If that's the case, then yes, I do, and I should totally do that. You guys are absolutely right. Okay, I'm gonna listen in here from Miko. At Miko two, the second stage will send a discrete command to the third stage to begin the initialization sequence. At that point, we should expect to start seeing. Uh, telemetry data from the third stage through their transmitter. 20 seconds after separation of the second and third stage, the third stage will ignite. And it will begin its 89 second burn. It's going to be pretty quick back to back here. This is such a long burn. I can't believe there's that big of an upper stage. That's awesome. Joshua says, be daring and do a video about the political climate of using Russian rockets and how that relates to the rocket investigation. I, uh, I tend to avoid anything that has anything to do tangentially even with politics. Um, it's just really not my forte. Um, really not what I <laughs> do into. But there is a lot of good rocket stuff when you, when you do deal with one minute remaining utilizing, go to. Um, uh, you, utilizing rockets from Russia. That's definitely something we have to consider. Um, be on the sun side or far side. Uh, I don't even know what the per privinit. I don't know what that word is. Privination. Is that like are you? Um, are you thinking of the perihelion, which is the lowest point where it'll be on the sun side or far side? Um, sorry, three-sided coin. I'm a little bit confused here. Um, pr will it be on the sun side or far side? That's a good. Qu and standing by for Miko momentarily. I don't know what pervination is or whatever that word is. Perivination. Um. Hopefully, I'll. And we uh, have Miko main engine cut off. Oh, periapsis is at Venus. Good question. Wow. I did not know that that was a word. So that'd be like the perihelion, perigee, uh, perivenetian. That makes total sense now. The lowest point of the sun. Or, I mean, of the of Venus. Now passing 38 minutes into flight. 
great question. Um, I don't know if it's on the on the far side or the near side. Third stage that, transmitter is on. I'm not very good at those gravity assists, but that is how you, uh, you know, since they're trying to lower the orbit, I think you do go in front of it. There we go. Stage separation. And visual cue there of separation. Third stage telemetry. Show us the payload animation. And we have acquisition of third stage telemetry. Okay, cool. Also, thank you so much, Marcus. I really appreciate it. Nice to have an upcoming launch as guide on your website. Didn't you know you did that? Hello from Norway, a Norwegian guy from Space Fest you met the first day. Oh, no way! That's awesome. Marcus, hi. Thank you for saying hi. I really appreciate that. I and we did see ignition you. on the third stage, seeing okay. chamber pressures, seeing some periodic dropouts of telemetry. Okay, hopefully everything's okay. Now 39 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. <laughs> Should be expecting to see third stage burnout momentarily. Apologize, we're still seeing some periodic dropouts of third stage telemetry. Difficult to make calls. Um, Mark, you put up a very, very convincing plea here. Let me just read this. You're right. Ain't no Planet X coming, cause ain't no space, cause ain't not Globe Earth. Yikes. You got me there. You absolutely got me there. <laughs> Thank you for that tip. I really hope that was just to make me laugh, cause that was great. Foot in the guy, do you know what Space Force is? A Star Wars movie. Um, space Force is basically a, a renaming of the Air Force's presence in space. Is, is all I can get of it so far. Um, it is going to be the defense sector of space. In a 40 minutes, 40 seconds into flight. Still um, seeing some telemetry dropouts from the third stage. At this point, the third stage would have uh, completed the burn and would be turning to the spacecraft separation burn attitude on a uh, nominal timeline. Still looking for some data to confirm that. Hopefully this is okay. They might just be in a place where there's not ground tracking stations. Okay, I'm hoping everything's okay. I don't like the silence here. This is not good. I mean, it's not not good, but I, I, it just feels a little funny. I think they're just waiting for acquisition of signal. So I hope that little probe survived. Delta flight commentary at 41 minutes, 56 seconds into flight. We are uh, still experiencing some dropout of third stage telemetry. I'm trying to confirm that uh, the sequence of events, and we'll provide updates when that's available. All right, come on, baby. You can do it. Hope everything's okay. Um, so um, yeah, so, so so back to back to Space Force. Honestly, I still don't have a good grasp of what Space Force will be, other than a, basically a rebranding of 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 the Air Force. So. Yeah, we'll have to see. I don't know if there's any plans for human space presence with Space Force. I don't know if there's any plans for Space Force, period, really, at this point. But we'll see. Um, Arthur, was this an expected loss of telemetry? I don't think it was, which is why it's a little bit worrying. Um, I'm kind of trying to read the faces on everyone here to see if we can get anything else out of them. Everyone is at their stations. No one's full-blown in panic mode yet. Yeah, passing 43 minutes into flight. 
And uh, per a nominal timeline for today's mission, should uh, be expecting to see spacecraft separation in approximately one minute. Hopefully everything's okay. Um, and then in Fussland, will, will the probe hit the sun eventually? That's a good question. Um, I don't think it ever would hit the sun. Um, it would take a lot more, uh, a lot more energy to actually lower uh, the 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 perihelion, the lowest point around the sun. You know, it's it is four million miles, six point four million kilometers away from the sun, and to bring that in even closer would take an insane amount of energy again. Like it'd take a whole other kick stage or something. So it would never crash into the sun, but it will probably eventually. Um, you know, after its lifespan, it will end up melting away. Um, thank you, uh, Nathaniel and Aaron. Can you do a, a bioregenerative life support system video? You guys are. And we've me been the hard informed that uh, the third stage is providing data to a ground station. Do not have real time data, so we will provide updates of those uh, events as they come in from a playback. Okay, so that's better than than no data um they're receiving basically playback data right now of the third stage it is now within range of a, a ground tracking station so hopefully everything's okay here at 44 minutes 30 seconds into flight uh still attempting to confirm uh occurrence of events for the third stage phase of flight Okay. And per a nominal timeline, should have expected to see spacecraft separation within the last minute. Okay, I hope everything's okay. They're not starting to look too nervous yet. But Aaron, yeah, um, I could if I... I'll, I'll, I'll look into bioregenerative life support systems. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, hoping we regain acquisition of data here at some point. There we go. It's a lot of clapping. Okay, good. I'm going to call it that everything's okay. Yes. And you're looking at a live shot there, the Delta Operations Center. Team shaking hands. Good. Okay, good. Everyone's clearly relieved and happy. <laughs> Fist bumping. There's Tori Bruno, the Teams in the Delta CEO. Operation Center shaking hands. Now the United Launch Alliance Mission Control Room. I'm gonna... We have had confirmation of spacecraft separation. Yes. I'm going to tweet this real quick. Congrats at NASA, at ULA. For a Beautiful launch tonight. Wish I was there. Hashtag Parker Solar Probe. ParkerSolarProbe.com Sweet. That makes me happy. I think I'm going to go to bed, guys. It's 318, and I'm going to get on a flight. Attention on that, too. Would like to confirm the spacecraft has acquired data. And we are working on a playback to get our third stage confirmation. But at this point, spacecraft is up and happy. Sweet. Who cares about the third stage of the spacecraft's okay? And confirmation of spacecraft separation there. You're looking at a live view inside the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory where teams were just celebrating. And I'm still joined here by Katie Nieves of Northrop Grumman. And Katie, can you tell me what's next for Northrop Grumman? Uh, well, congratulations to the entire team. Um, best of best of luck for Parker Solar Probe. Um, the, uh, so, I'm going to answer a few more questions here quick. Um, <laughs> Footnut guy. <laughs> uh, you might be right. Uh, Footy23, Space Force could be a good way for SpaceX and others to access that sweet, sweet military budget. Your thoughts? SpaceX and others already do actually access a lot of the military budget. They do launch for, you know, the, the Air Force, for the NROL. Um, they already do access a good amount of uh, military spending. So I don't know if Space Force will really be that different, to be honest. I kind of think it's just cutting a cake in half and saying there's two new cakes and renaming one of them. Um, I don't really know. I think we're just going to have to kind of wait and see uh, what exactly happens with it. But 
Um, if there's increased funding for the space factor, space sector, I'm definitely not going to complain. Um, Lee, you're, you're Alex, you're eight from Australia. You love watching my videos, so I'm giving you some of my pocket. What? Well, geez, well, thank you, Lee. Dang, or Alex, I guess. Sorry. Thank you so much, Alex. You really don't have to do that. Save up your money and, and, and do awesome things with it. Um, but I really appreciate that. Hopefully my videos make you happy and make you smile. So thank you so much, Alex. Um, and uh, I hope you have a fantastic, let's see, it's probably like midday now. So have a great rest of your weekend. Um, hopefully that was a good cap off to your weekend. Um, okay, so they've gone, we've gone through all that stuff. So I'm going to get ready to wrap out here, guys. I got to get to bed. Again, I have that flight tomorrow. So we're now gaming. Just goes to show you can never relax on the launch until final confirmations. Exactly. And that's one of those things. I think we all get spoiled when we are watching SpaceX launches. We get so excited about the stage landing that we often forget <laughs> the important part is the mission itself. It's the deployment of the satellite or the payload. Getting it into space is really all that matters. Forget that booster. That booster is only worth $30 million. The spacecraft, on the other hand, sometimes is a billion dollar spacecraft. So we definitely need to remember that and, and continue to tune in and be as engaged for spacecraft deployment. Because although it might not be as exciting visually, and might not be as cutting edge because we've been doing it since the you know 50s and 60s. It is very, very, very important. It's it's the reason why the launch is happening. So that's exactly right. Um, yeah. So um, all right, everybody. Um, ooh, uh, Captain Kurt. Uh, yes, Captain Kurt. Pay attention in Discord and or so in our Discord channel. Pay attention in Discord and on Patreon. I will be doing. I'll letting patrons know. Uh, where we can meet up here for free um, Monday night. Um, yes, I will. I will be letting you guys know. So, um, so st tune in there. Uh, we'll be doing a, a meet up there. So, yeah, tune in, Captain Captain Kurt. Um, so yeah, so thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate you all saying hi, and thank you so much again to you guys. Those were insanely generous tips tonight. I, I really genuinely don't deserve it. it I, I wish, I just hope that through getting other people excited about spaceflight that we're able to increase funding, increase people wanting to go to college and study uh, and become the next scientists, the next engineers, the next rocket scientists, the next explorers. That's the whole point. Um, I'll keep going. I will keep producing content everywhere, uh, working my butt off, hiring new people, getting the website bigger, making more cool things for you guys. I will. I promise I will continue to work my absolute hardest. Um, I, I'm still really excited about this stuff, and I wouldn't be doing it without you guys. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for telling your friends. Um, <laughs> um, Torstein says, Flat Earthers, they don't think it be like it is, but it do. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, uh, so uh, just one last reminder. If you do want to help continue uh, to support what I do, uh, and to make Everyday Astronaut more and more uh, of, a, of a big deal where we have more content for you to, to, to ingest, whether it be websites, uh, you know, articles, uh, the pre-launch previews, if you want to help make more videos, uh, music, whatever, whatever you need, I want to make as much of it as I can, and I can only do that thanks to my Patreon supporters. Seriously, Discord, I love you guys. Uh, and if you want to join our exclusive Discord channel, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And again, for your chance to win space, flown space shuttle material, head on over to uh, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut for your chance to win. So thank you, guys. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to get on a flight. I'm going to California tomorrow. So wish me luck. Hopefully you'll be seeing. There's so much content coming from, from my boat here, so get ready. There will be way too much of it in the near future. Um, but that's going to do it for me, guys. Um... I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend, everybody. Bye.